Strange things are happening in Antarctica. In the last 50 years, the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula has warmed up by two degrees centigrade. It may not seem much, but in environmental terms, it's massive. And the titanic ice sheets that fringe the land there are disintegrating. These ice shelves aren't little thin ice, pieces of thin ice. They are massive, massive structures um, with many cubic kilometers of ice in them, hundreds or thousands of cubic kilometers of ice. That is all melting. George VI ice shelf, one of the big ones, is receding fast. Apparently the last eight or 10 years, it's gone back many miles. Now, we're only going on hearsay. We're going to find out. Ironically, for seaborne explorers like Sir Peter Blake, the retreating ice is revealing an undiscovered world, uncharted waters. Peter and his crew are aiming for the George VI Sound and its vanishing ice shelf. They hope to reach 70 south, further up the sound than any vessel has been before. This is truly uncharted territory. Sir Peter Blake is a sailing legend. He has triumphed in races across the globe, winning the America's Cup not once, but twice. Now he's abandoned the ticker tape parades for a new mission, as a special envoy to the United Nations Environmental Program, charting the changing health of our world. And even a lifetime at sea cannot prepare him for what lies ahead. I haven't been where we have to shove through the ice, where we have to be on our guard 24 hours a day, where we have to be very, very aware of where we anchor because of the, the winds that can change instantaneously, go from naught knots to 60 knots within a few minutes, um, where if you make a big mistake, it might be a fatal mistake. It's been an amazing trip so far, getting up close and personal with Antarctica's amazing residents. Pushing south towards their final goal, they're trying to understand the critical role of the apparently lifeless ice in making this strange place tick. Seamaster has been traveling down the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula. Now they've reached the Antarctic Circle. It's a further 210 miles south to the George VI Sound. As they push south, further off the beaten track, the hazards multiply. The apparent precision of the charts here can give a false sense of security. Place too much faith in them, and they can kill you. Because so few ships have traveled here that the charted position of the land is not to be trusted. Uh, there are many comments on the charts that this was last surveyed 150 years ago. Some of the places we're going to are four, five, six, eight, ten miles out of their actual position. Sailing through a narrow and dangerous channel, the navigation computer places the ship ashore. A thousand feet up the side of this mountain, calculated by satellite to within a few meters, it's not the ship's position that is wrong, it's the land's. Um, and the charts do say the further south we get, don't rely upon these charts. They are, they are non-existent soundings, there will be rocks where none have been seen before because no one's been there before, so we'll be on our own. And I think that's the exciting time. We're going to be going where no one has been before. They must abandon their modern technology and instead rely more and more on the evidence of their eyes. Down here, even straightforward activities are challenges. Anchor close to the thick ice that covers the land 
and they could wake to find themselves buried under a thousand ton icefall. A lack of shelter can leave them exposed to Antarctica's violent and unpredictable winds. But bergs have already visited most of the sheltered waters, and if they're not actually blocking them, they've scraped the seafloor smooth, leaving little for the anchor to bite on. Finding a safe haven is tense and demanding. We're going to snuck in here with shallow to get out of the way of the bergs, hopefully. 4-2. Four, 4-0. Four, Thank you. Lost the bottom. Rising sharply. 30. 43. No room in here. You can't hear. Not much room, is there? You can't hear? No room. What do you mean? 20. What do you mean there's no room? Well, no room to swing. We'd have to moor. Yeah, leave me alone, eh, guys? Come on, let me do it myself, eh? Got to go around again now. 18. OK, I want to do it all on my own, all right? 17. I've got to, I've got to do what I want to do now, all right? Good. It's very really good, yeah. It's actually low on a front, so the isobars are going to widen out. Ahead lies a section of the journey with no safe refuges at all, so Peter pours carefully over the weather charts. You have to be a higher round. While down below, Jano gives the ship's systems a last check. Seamaster is the perfect tool for what lies ahead. She is an icebreaker, class A, so. She, she is able to, to break ice up to three feet thick. That's enough for in, uh, young ice. Old ice, nothing, nothing goes through. Even the, the, the biggest ice breaker. This, as it goes by, if we miss this. A lifetime at sea has taught Peter how to look into this confusing mass of symbols and see what the weather holds for them and it seems to hold good news. We're going to go down to the ice shelf. I think tomorrow is going to be the day. Yeah. But despite Peter's careful analysis, they are hit by storm force winds. Wind chill plummets below minus 20. Peter's analysis of the weather is expert, but these winds are unlike any in his experience. Down here, the normal rules don't apply. These are the infamous catabatic winds, driven by the bitter cold of the Antarctic land. Up on the bitter glacial slopes, in contact with the ice, air grows cold and dense. Then, unpredictably, this layer of heavier air begins to slide down the slope, accelerating to speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. This is a catabatic wind, localized and totally unpredictable. Continuing in the extreme wind chill will quickly exhaust the small team. They must turn back. After a fruitless day, they find shelter behind an island amidst the jostling bergs. They are no further south than they were when they began. We started out going 25 miles. We've done about 60. We've ended up 10 miles from where we are. Catabatic winds of Antarctic. Welcome. To the south, the localized catabatic winds continue to rage. While they wait, the crew take a well-earned break. A bit of golden syrup on this porridge here. Oh, what do you like for the porridge? Away from the catabatics, the weather is as calm as Peter predicted, and they take the opportunity to look around. Because Antarctica's deathly white ice is not just beautiful, it's a refuge for life. Come winter, the sun disappears, and temperatures plummet. What thrives down here must be able to lie dormant, covered by snow and frost. 
but spring into life and growth at the slightest opportunity. Looking for this hidden life, they find incredible sights, like this magnificent cave hollowed out from a wall of ice by an underground stream of melting water. Beauty here is more than skin deep. Heading south, they've seen whole ice slopes stained red. It's one of Antarctica's wonders, life not on the ice, but inside it. Hey Mark, look at this. Why is this stuff red? They produce some color to protect themselves against the cold and against the sun as well. Wow. Algae in Antarctica can actually grow within the snow and ice, not just here on the land, but in the sea ice too. In summer, similar microalgae are released from the melting sea, feeding the beginning of the Antarctic food chain. Catastrophic melting of Antarctic ice is a major environmental concern but a degree of natural melting actually underpins life down here. Oh, Mark, look here. Watch it. You don't step on it. All the moss growing. Nice. Wow. wonder how old it is. Like a thousand years or like ten thousand years it can be. It just grows like really, really slow. Yeah, you don't see much green out here, so it's a nice change of pace to be yeah. able to see some moss. So and it specialized in living on bird feces. And it also has a mechanism so it can live on the, the salt that mm. comes out of the water. Highly specialized is everything down here. Huh. That describes all Antarctic life. Highly specialized to live on the edge. That's why it is such a good barometer of change. Because this is as cold as life can tolerate. Period. If things warm up, the algaes, mosses and lichens will spread further south until they hit the limit of cold that life can endure. If it then cools down, it will retreat northwards. This is the tide mark of life, the edge of the possible. Watching it will help us understand what's happening. The ice down here seems durable, permanent. In fact, the whole landscape is continually shifting. This is the source of Antarctica's most obvious hazards, icebergs. And it's easy to see how this happens if you get up on top of these glaciers. But they can be treacherous and you need the right equipment and the right attitude. place like this is breathtaking. You're always looking at things like the weather, what, what the wind is doing. Today it's sunny and gorgeous, there's a light wind and there's a clear horizon, so we're safe. A place like this where you're very much out of your elements as far as survival goes, you've got to have your wits about you. What looks very solid is actually slowly sliding off the side of the hill here and dropping into the ocean. So. It may be, may be one year, it may be ten years, but what I'm sitting on now will be in the ocean. Basically, it's a frozen river, and it will always follow the path of least resistance. Over here, this, uh, this glacier here, the edge is about close to 100 feet high. At the end of it, where it, where it reaches the sea, that's sort of similar to a frozen waterfall, really, and it tumbles off as the ice behind it pushes it forward. The Katabatics have finally subsided, and they push south again towards the George VI Sound. Ah! 
The sea is littered with huge icebergs. With only a fifth of their bulk above the surface, many of these bergs are aground. Here, they will gradually melt away, eventually returning to the ocean. It's an iceberg graveyard. This berg probably weighs the thick end of four million tons. Stop to have a look at what I think is a pretty magnificent berg. I mean, it's not huge, but it's quite high. And we're in 170 metres of water, which is over 500 feet. And this thing is sitting on the bottom, so there's a lot of ice here. There's some big spurs that go out under the water, so, uh, which are parts of the, the old iceberg, um, so we can't get in too close. There's also some big cracks in the upper area, and, up a cliff face, so we won't get too close in case they fall off into the sea. Look at it. Ah. In the clear, dry Antarctic air, it can be hard to appreciate the scale of things. But sometimes, size just doesn't matter. From far away, one small berg catches the eye. It is electric blue. Oh, sacra blue. Under the titanic weight of the glacier that spawned it, the ice at the bottom has had the air crushed out of it, forming perfect crystalline blue ice that has been dumped in the sea by an advancing glacier. Bergs like this are a rare treat for us. With the end of Antarctic summer just around the corner, they push the last hundred miles south. Everyone takes their turn on watch, with the ever-present danger of bergs all around. With no catabatic winds, they're making good time. Seamaster is halfway across Marguerite Bay. It's only a further 70 miles. Worryingly, progress has been easier than expected. This area here normally is uh, fast ice. At this time of the year, midsummer, you couldn't get a boat here like this. Maybe an icebreaker might be able to work its way in. But we understand this year we're going to be able to get right into the sound and maybe quite close to the edge of the receding ice shelf. So out to port here, we have the wordy ice shelf, only there isn't one anymore. We understand it's all gone. And we're talking about um, hundreds of square kilometers of ice, very thick ice. It's normally there permanently, has disappeared. This, where we are now, normally solid ice is not anymore. It'll be ice again in the winter time, but now the first summer in living memory, it's just liquid with a lot of bergs around. In the last decade, the idea that the mass of Antarctic ice could melt has generated real fears of a devastating rise in sea levels that would perhaps change the face of our planet, swamping coastal regions. Billions of tonnes of ice makes a lot of water. But as our understanding improves, we've discovered that global warming is far more complex than that. Sea levels are still expected to rise, but Antarctica may actually absorb some of this rising water, not add to it. But that doesn't let us off the hook. Far from it. The more immediate risk of global warming is that local hot and cold spots will develop across the globe. And the dramatic temperature rise on the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula is exactly the kind of thing we should be worrying about. The George VI ice shelf should be a key indicator of this change. 
By the end of the day, Seamaster has finally reached the mouth of the George VI Sound. Ice is everywhere now, and they cannot continue in the twilight. With no good anchorages, they must use their ingenuity. The water's too deep to anchor in, so we thought we'd uh, give it an attempt to use a bergy bit as a sea anchor and wrap a line around the bergy bit, not too big. If anything goes uh, afoul, we just let the line go and start the engines and motor off. Oh. Never done this before <laughs> in my life. It <laughs> seemed like a good idea, though. <laughs> Guys, land on that. Guys, quick. It's more or less just like a bollard on a dock. It's so old and solid and dense, it's just like metal. I just think going up here tonight, with the light going down and everything else, is not a good move. There's a lot of ice in the water <laughs> off the glacier. You're running out of line now. It's getting bloody cold. Oh, you got I think we'll, we can worry about that yeah. in the morning. Uh, when we've got a bit of light, the sun's up and the stuff. We'll enjoy it a lot more too, I will. Tomorrow morning, they will move up into the sound. They know where the ice shelf is supposed to be on their charts. But what will they find? In 1974, when the George VI Sound was last surveyed, the charts show a towering ice sheet hundreds of feet high blocked the Sound 40 miles in from its mouth. On the chart is a blank area in front of the ice sheet with no depth markings. This is where the frozen sea stopped the survey ship. The end of charted waters. Just after midday, the ship runs off the end of the soundings. They enter uncharted waters. No ship has ever been here before. I can see why the average boat doesn't come up here. As they push south, the sea is cluttered with broken pieces of sea ice. With Alastair in the crow's nest, they pick their way through. And when that's not possible, Seamaster's remarkable ice-breaking skills get them out of trouble. After two hours in unknown waters, they reach the unbroken sea ice stretching 20 miles across the width of the sound. Their latitude is 69 degrees 52 minutes south, a tantalizing eight miles short of 70 south. But even Seamaster cannot push through this. Almost, I think, as far as we're going to get up the sound, up against the solid sea ice over there. We're going to wind across to the east of it and see if we can find another lead. We think we can get another couple of miles up that way. The sea ice is a strange place, unlike anything else they have seen in Antarctica, and teeming with life. According to the charts, the towering ice shelf should be only a couple of miles further south, clearly visible over the frozen sea. But in the crystal clear air, they can see nothing.
They want to secure the ship by planting a steel post. But the ice is like iron. They will have to try something different. I don't know if it will be a solution. The, the next attempt will be the sledgehammer for the, the poles. And if it doesn't work, we'll do a, a nice ice baller with the, the chainsaw. But being on a ship as strong as Seamaster offers Peter a more radical solution. Life is everywhere around them. Pods of minky whales dive below the sea ice to feed, surfacing at the edge every 10 minutes or so for air. But the minkies seem naturally curious about the new arrivals. Look at that. She's in the nest of old now. Came right round, under the boat, <laughs> out and back round, just, just to see what's what. Yeah. Out on the ice, Ollie and Jackie find a scruffy-looking group of Adélie penguins, molting last year's feathers, because their coats must be perfect to survive the Antarctic winter. Sitting on a thin skin of ice with a kilometer of ocean below, it is a truly alien land. I've been all around the world several times. I'm just absolutely blown away by this place. It's just the most beautiful, pristine, raw, savage, extraordinary place I've ever been to. It's fabulous, it's wonderful, it's unique. There's so many things happening and you try, you want to capture everything because it's the only time in your life, probably. You can see it like this. It's no surprise to see the penguins huddled on the ice. Patrolling the ice edge is their old enemy, the leopard seal. Leopard seals are all muscle. Females may weigh close to half a ton and be as long as a small car. They are dangerous predators and can rarely resist a tasty penguin snack. But penguins aren't exactly thick on the ground here. How will that affect her behavior? <laughs> Ollie takes some of the crew out onto the ice to try and find out more. The predator of the ice shelf, that's the attraction. They've we'll come around and give us a kiss on the cheek. We don't know a lot about it, so it's actually it's a good trek today to, to get out here on this little crack in the ice. It serves as kind of a highway for these guys and uh, see what kind of activity we see. Yeah, yeah. See what kind of uh, mannerisms these guys have. The so leopard seal's favorite trick is to drag its prey out into open water Holly is securely roped to the ice. We got it on the high speed winch. Yep. Quick recovery. Yep. Yep. Holly spends six hours in the sub zero water. But apart from one or two curious crab eater seals, there is nothing. The leopard seal just will not take the bait, even if the bait is Ollie. Hey. What are you doing, Ollie? Oh, just hanging around for a leopard. So yeah, you've been really in the water, all all this time. Are you tied on? Not much swimming in the water oh, just today. in case it's a tug of war. Yeah. You know. I think you'd probably quite like that, wouldn't you? But it happens if this leopard gets you, Mark pulls you in with the rope. Exactly. At yeah. least what's left. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hopefully, diving below the ice will be more successful. 
Perhaps it will explain why they have stumbled on such a variety of life in one place. But it's dangerous work. Unknown currents can sweep them away below the ice, and layers of fresh meltwater make buoyancy difficult to control. Get it wrong, and it's a crushing thousand meters to the sea floor. Below the surface, conditions appear disappointing. In fact, the poor visibility explains a lot. And the water was very, very murky. You see nothing, it's, uh, it's amazing. When the ice melts in summer, all these algaes, which are already in the ice, are growing very fast and very numerous. Uh, that's why the water is so, so murky. We saw nothing in the water because of the algaes, but above the water and above the ice, we saw, we saw minky whales, we, we saw grey beetles, leopard seals, penguins, only Adelis and one emperor, but we are very south, it's, it's very good. So all these people, all these guys are related to the algae. They all are here because of the algae. That's, that's the way. Ironically, the faster the sea ice melts, the more nutrients it will release into the water and the better the life around here will do. The variety of life we're seeing around the edge of the ice may be a result of faster melting, but a population explosion here could easily disturb the delicate balance of life in Antarctica. The small crew are exhausted by the long haul south. And down here, tiredness can be a killer. So Peter declares a day of rest. It's a surreal place for a vacation. Fancy seeing you guys here. Welcome to my little oasis in paradise. <laughs> it's not skinny. Oh, she's a lovely evening on the beach tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's the water temperature is minus two centigrade. Who told me the water was warm in Tahiti? But as the crew rest, out on the ice, the leopard seal finally makes a move, and it's completely unexpected. Like all predators, they must play to their strengths. In the water, they are powerful, fast and agile, with a deadly grip from their powerful teeth. On land, they are slow, moving with a curious snake-like motion. Their diet was believed to be limited to krill, penguins and seal pups. Though krill may be abundant down here, Penguins and seal pups are not. But there are plenty of adult crab eater seals about. But whatever the leopard seal's interest, this crab eater seal is not going to stay and find out. Totally unaware, Two more crab eaters are heading straight for her. Somewhere below the surface, they meet. This time, she is serious. She wants them in the water, where her greatest strength will tell. Their best defense is to get out. Despite her failure, the crabbies are rattled.
It's impossible to be sure whether this is genuine hunting or just good practice, though if it is practice, it's pretty vicious. Because even the scientists who have spent their lives studying these remarkable animals have never seen this kind of behavior before. In fact, no one in the world has seen this before. Still, she isn't finished. Working her way up a crack in the sea ice, her powerful muscles allow her to lift her head clear and check out the prey. It's known as spy hopping, and her target becomes clear. But whatever her intentions, it's clear that she has not evolved to hunt prey this size. Her jaws will not open quite far enough to get a death grip. We cannot be sure if this is even unusual behavior, as no one has been here before. Is there a shortage of food? Is it related to the retreating ice? Or is this how this leopard seal has always behaved, unseen by man, until now? Only further study can answer that. Seamaster rests a tantalizing eight miles from her goal of 70 South. But in the shifting ice, a narrow channel of open water has appeared, leading further south. It's tempting, but it could close again just as easily as it opened. And they can't ignore that possibility. Ernest Shackleton's ship, Endurance, became trapped in sea ice and was crushed and utterly destroyed. It's Peter's call. From this exercise point of view, the boat has sunk. Before making the decision on whether to push further south through the ice, Peter wants to know how the crew perform in an abandoned ship drill. The history books show that the risks can't be ignored because Ernest Shackleton was trapped in the sea ice on his ship Endurance. The sea ice just engulfed him. They tried everything. They set sail, they did everything, but there was no way they could break free. We had an exercise here which gave us 30 minutes, but he got off after some months they finally decided they'd have to abandon the ship. And within a month of getting off, the ship sunk. And they were totally on their own. They had no way of getting any outside help. Nobody even knew who, where they were or that they were stuck or anything. Strange enough, if you look over there, there's ice behind us and ice here. And we're actually in between two uh, sets of ice, if you like. And if it all decided to turn funny on us, we could find ourselves shut in here. So it's not that much of an exercise. It's actually quite a possibility that one could find yourself stuck in the ice. Shackleton didn't lose a single member of his team through planning, ingenuity, good leadership and luck. As Seamaster pushes south through a gap in the ice, her crew need to know what they're getting into. Plague Expeditions Yacht Seamaster, 70 South Waver. We, the underside, are willing to continue and explore further south through the King George Ice Shelf. We are fully conscious of the consequences that we may become beset in the ice and have to remain for the duration of the winter or until such time as the ice permits departure. At a latitude of 69 degrees, 54 and a half minutes, they reach their furthest point south, just five and a half miles short of 70 south. 
According to the chart, Seamaster should now be right below the face of an ice sheet, hundreds of feet high. But still, there is nothing to see, even in the clear Antarctic air. This places the ice sheet at least 20 miles further back than it was in 1974. Approximately 75 billion tons of ice has vanished. As this was all floating ice, it won't raise sea levels. But that doesn't make its loss any less serious, because sea ice is vital in controlling global temperatures. All this white snow and ice reflects sunlight and heat back into space. If the amount of sea ice is reduced, there is less reflected heat and light, and the oceans warm. This in turn makes more sea ice melt. It's a dangerous and vicious circle that can only accelerate global change. But in a terrible irony, the breakup of the sea ice offers the divers one amazing moment. As Seamaster approaches the ice to tie up, diver Mark gets very excited. Oh, look at the water, oh my God. For just a moment, the divers have the chance of a lifetime. The newly fractured face of the sea ice has yet to melt. The water is free of algae, completely clear. The holy grail for diving is water so deep, so blue, that uh, you feel that the only limiting factor is purely the physics of light penetrating water. It's a very good uh, feeling to be in such water with nothing else than blue and a bit of ice on, on top of the head. It's very strange and very strong feeling. It's an amazing feeling swimming up to the ice shelf where you see this looming shadow up in front of you. To swim into this dark space and all of a sudden come into a completely different contrast. Another world where it's lit up by the ceiling up above you. Looking up, you see these large fissures and cracks where the ice uh, is thin and the light's illuminating through it. Uh, you see the colors and the textures of the tint in the colors. But even while we dive, the window of perfect visibility is closing. The melting ice begins to release clouds of algae that have been growing within it. This algae fuels the very beginning of the whole summer bonanza of life that we have witnessed. We are actually swimming through the powerhouse of all Antarctic life. It all begins with the melting ice. Those greens and, and yellows are microalgae uh, growing uh, in between the ice the crystals they are the the first beginning of the of the life in in antarctica so it's a, it's a precious color very uh, very precious color It's now the peak of the summer breakup of the sea ice. Every morning they find themselves adrift. Eventually, this ice will choke the sound and block their exit. And it's not just the sea ice that threatens them. Late in the evening, a huge berg weighing tens of millions of tons catches on the sea ice and begins to swing round on the ship. All of a sudden, over, well, not really all of a sudden, but ever so slowly, half of Europe is attacking us from the, behind here. There's a possibility of being squashed by this amazingly large berg against this ice flow. So, we must go. You'll miss the bus. 
We're leaving. Come on, guys. With the sea ice fracturing ahead of them and bergs creeping up behind, it's time to leave. Tomorrow morning, they will head north. But Antarctica has one more surprise for them. Throughout their stay, the minke whales have been feeding ceaselessly below the ice. But not long before midnight, the whales' behavior suddenly changes. Many of them appear on the surface together in a group. Their explosive breathing reverberates throughout the ship. I was laying on my rack, and I, that's all I could, all I could hear is whales breathing through the sides of the boat. <laughs> Crazy. Lowering the hydrophone into the water, they hear the song of the whales for the first time. The whales are speaking. They have the same voices and pop voices. Half a lifetime as a sonar expert on nuclear submarines means these sounds are old friends of Jano. Very much like being in a, inside a zoo cage looking out because we're the, the foreign things brought into their environment. And they're just, they're, they're not, <clears throat> not phased by us at all. I reckon you're right, that definitely sounds like a, a big sonar ping, doesn't it? Just bouncing off the ice. Oh, yes. That's a very low frequency sonar. Ecolocation. It's the beautifulest place I've ever seen in my life. It's simply alive. Even with departure just around the corner, they cannot drop their guard. So they continue with their lonely vigil of night watches. Nighttime here is never darker than a deep twilight that gives the land a strange, mysterious quality. Every time you come up on deck or go for a walk, it's just so vast, so pure and untouched and inhospitable. To me, I see this, and I see the surface of the moon right here. I look at the effects of the lighting on the snow and on the features. It's amazing. Not only has the expedition revealed an amazing and unstudied cornucopia of life, but they've managed to penetrate further south up the sound than any vessel before. They know the ice shelf here has receded far out of sight, confirming the breakup of this part of Antarctica. For the whole crew, it's been a sobering lesson in how little we know and what the future may hold if we don't get to grips with what's really happening to our world and wake up to the consequences. There is no doubt that this part of Antarctica has warmed up fast in the last century. There's no doubt that the ice shelves are breaking up. And this is exactly the sort of hotspot that climatologists are scared may cause devastating problems across the globe. We know that Antarctica's interaction with the rest of the globe is complex and critical, and no one is sure how serious the consequences will be. If we are responsible for this, and it's looking more and more likely that we are, then what will our descendants make of our legacy to them? Across the globe are scattered the pulse points that let us check on the health of our world. For Peter and his crew, Antarctica is just the first of many pulse points that Seamaster will carry them to 
over the next five years, charting the health of our changing planet.